Okay. Well, welcome to um, our live audience, wherever you may be, um, as far away as Durban, South Africa, and probably elsewhere. I'm uh, talking today with Sakit Sony um, of Resilience Force. Sakit, you've been uh, literally in the, in the eye of a hurricane, and it's not the first one you've seen. So I'm wondering if you might just give us a few uh, insights of your own. And I'm assuming this helps reinforce in the most powerful um, energy possible, the, the sort of need for fundamental change in sort of labor market uh, protections and the need for a resilience uh, core. We'll come back to that in a moment, but give you an opportunity to tell us what's going on. Well, um, first of all, thanks for having me on, Sean, and, and good to reconnect with you. Um, you know, we often talk about um, climate change as um, a future occurrence that we want to intercept and reverse before it's too late. We talk about climate change with great urgency um, in terms of, you know, degrees of heat um, and are trying to set out before it's too late to reverse emissions. But for many across the United States and across the world, um, in frontline communities, um, climate change has already disrupted, changed, transformed an entire way of life. Um, and we're more aware of this than, than ever. There are um, unprecedented floods in the Midwest this year, um, unprecedented fires um, in California and the West Coast. And where I've just been, um, and where most of our work is based in the Gulf Coast of the United States, um, we're having the most active hurricane season um, in close to two decades. Um, we're only halfway in, and there have been um, close to half a dozen full-blown hurricanes, countless tropical storms. Um, and I've just come back from evacuating out of the path of Hurricane Delta. We ran out of uh, English letters to name hurricanes this season and crossed over to the Greek alphabet. Uh, almost uh, an admission of the kind of mythical proportions now of the challenge we're dealing with. I met people who evacuated not once, not twice, uh, but three, four, five times um, this year, this season, um, and came back home to um, broken streets, flooded homes, um, you know, damaged neighborhoods, cities that need to be rebuilt. So, you know, climate change um, and recovery after uh, hurricanes, floods and fires um, is really a perpetual project for many, many people, millions in this country. And that's what I've just come back from witnessing, um, you know, the the climate refugees uh, who we believe to be sometimes um, a future visitor at the borders of the country is already here. Um, they, they are already uh, among us. They are us. They're a flood or a fire away. They're born in the U.S. Um, they're crossing between, um, you know, uh, Lake Charles and Baton Rouge and Shreveport and Gulfport. Um, and the people helping them come home um, are a new workforce. But this kind of onset of climate chaos combined with the impacts of the pandemic, I mean, you've written that resilience is our number one national priority now, and presumably we need a workforce that reflects that priority. Do you see any change in the sort of public debates uh, around the value of immigrant workers, that some of the demands that have been now on the table for several decades for citizenship and full rights. Are we closer as a result of the pandemic and the climate emergency? Do you think we are making progress? Yeah, I think we can get closer. Um, I, I think we can get closer, but it's not inevitable. The first thing we have to do is visualize the work. You know, there, there was a time when no one thought that there would be much of a market for cars. And um, in fact, the best projections of the time uh, were that, you know, we would sell 400, 500 cars at best. 
Um, and this new workforce that was rising up mostly in the Midwest to build cars, you know, would, would, would be a niche workforce and then, and then would move on to, you know, uh, do what they always did, uh, you know, um, other kinds of early manufacturing. It turned out um, that all those projections about cars um, were wrong. Um, and, you know, the auto workers... Uh, became a spine of the American middle class. Um, they became a political force. Um, they became, through their unions, um, most importantly, um, you know, people with good, well-paying jobs and uh, and bargaining power. They they held a key for the transformation of the rules of the economy in the United States. Speaking, speaking of unions though, the idea of a resilience force should be supported by you know, a broad band of uh, the labor movement. Um, are, you seeing, are you seeing any um, um, change in the, in, in the labor narrative? I know you, you've been involved with labor unions and through the Guest Workers Alliance and what they used to call alt labor a few years ago. Maybe they still call it now. But are you seeing this as something that could resonate with trade unions as a way of boosting membership and raising living standards at the same time? Well, I, 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 I think there is um, certainly a possibility, but, but, I, but I think there needs to be just a, a a deeper understanding, you know, of this workforce as mm. climate change has become um, more present in our lives, um, as um, you know, carbon emissions and heat um, have made precipitation rise, and um, you know, have made extreme weather events, hurricanes, floods, and fires more. Uh, destructive and more frequent um, recovery and rebuilding after disasters has become the United States' number one perpetual infrastructure project year in and year out. Um, we have billions of dollars of damage and that's only the damage we can monetize, we can count. Um, you made reference to the sort of works progress administration of the New Deal era and um, do you see this resilience force as a sort of a permanent body of workers that can both respond to emergencies, but also when presumably there's periods of lull in, in the extreme weather and who knows how long those periods might be, that they would then turn or be redeployed to do work on say retrofitting houses and insulation work, environmental services more broadly. In other words, a permanent part of the US uh, labor force in the public sector. You know, that's our vision. Um, it's not the way it is right now. Um, right now, just like any new workforce, um, the people coming in to rebuild your home, to put blue tarp on your roof. So just, you know, let's take a step back and think about it. So, you know, a hurricane comes to Louisiana or Alabama, uh, or as happened earlier this year, uh, record rainfall uh, makes rivers rise and overwhelms dams in Michigan. Dams break um, and cities are flooded. Um, so what happens next is um, that roads, hospitals, schools, homes, um, all of those require rapid repair. The next one year is a race against time to, um, to quickly, quickly um, throw tarp on roofs, uh, you know, recover walls, remove debris, all before mold can, um, you know, take a deep hold uh, of, of all of the structures. And that's only the physical rebuilding. Um, there's the rebuilding of our healthcare infrastructure, our social service infrastructure. There's emergency needs like food. So all of this requires a labor force. That's what the resilience workforce is doing um, in uh, Louisiana right now with two hurricanes in six weeks. This is the workforce that's coming in um, and rebuilding homes, schools, government buildings so that these cities um, can rebuild. Now in an ideal world, we have a large scale public sector workforce and um, 
these are workers like the Works Progress Administration um, that are building and rebuilding the country, but also building social cohesion. These would be people who would be able to do mitigation and adaptation work year round. But and when was presumably a, a multi-scaled workforce as well, because there are so many things involved with adaptation and resilience that um, it's quite an exciting prospect to think there could be a whole new uh, group of workers uh, with the skills to, to right. pay attention to these pressing issues. That's right. You you have um, you know uh, nurses and carpenters, welders and pipe fitters. Um, people who could retrofit homes, schools, and buildings, um, people who could take care um, to the doorstep, community health workers, counselors, all of these people that are needed more and more um, as a permanent part of our work of you know, mitigating um, and, adap and, and adapting you know, in order to build this new country we need. All of that um, could be part, all of those people could be part of this workforce. When disasters occur, we'd be able to pull them from the ranks of this permanent workforce and deploy them to disaster areas. That's, um, that's the, uh, you, you know, that's the hope. Um, that's not the way that disaster response and climate adaptation is happening now. And, um, you know, frankly, that's the, the fact that it's not happening now um, is, um, you know, is a cause of a lot of suffering. Yes, yes. I'm, um, I've it looks like I've lost you visually for a second, but um, while we're waiting for you to come back, the, I Sorry. was always impressed by the- Can you back now? Yes, I can see you now. Okay, great. great. Right. I was always impressed by the Rural Electrification Administration as well in the 1930s. I mean, talk about mission impossible. You know, 6% of rural homes had electricity. Poverty was just absolutely, and this is before the Depression era, there was the Depression in agriculture, and then there was all sorts of ecological damage done by over farming, which is where the Dust Bowl came from. Mm -hmm. And that that New Deal program was, I think, is at least as successful as any of the others and still another example of how you put resources together, people to work, develop skills. And I think it was the first area where unions um, got into the public sector was in the uh, TV, Tennessee Valley Authority. And um, so that vision uh, always inspires me. But it also, I think, raises a question about in the climate debate, getting the right balance between what you you know what is being called mitigation the reduction of emissions now in order to prevent damage in the future and adaptation has the debate been too much towards mitigation and maybe not enough on this immediate crisis that we're facing and how to respond to it or is it just something that um, happens at the global level and where emissions reduction seems to be the main focus of the debates you know, I've been trying to figure this out, Sean, and maybe you can help me sort of track this and think this through. Um, I often feel like it's a false debate. Mm. Um, of course, we need large scale mitigation projects. Um, you know, um, chemical plants, power plants, um, warehouses, large scale factories, um, but also the carbon footprint, um, you know, of um, entire cities. Um, all of this needs large scale mitigation and therefore needs a workforce. So, so you have to set out, um, you know, to redesign, rebuild, repurpose um, in order to decrease carbon emissions. And that's only one small part of the mitigation work that's needed. Um, there's, there's ecological work and all of these other kinds of work. So, so absolutely, that's important. Um, the, here's the thing, though. The other thing that's needed is to recognize that there are already communities um, who are on the front lines of climate change and are hurting year after year. 
So, um, you know, those dams that broke in this year's first climate disaster in Michigan, where rivers rose and floodwaters overwhelmed um, the Edenville and Sanford dams and flooded the city of Midland and tens of thousands evacuated. You know, that's an example of a community downstream from a very old structure. Those dams, neighborhoods in flood zones, um, you know, they need to adapt um, to uh, the new threat uh, posed by floods, fires, tornadoes, and hurricanes. And, you know, those two needs um, don't necessarily need to compete with each other. Um, we need to mitigate and reduce carbon emissions. We also need to take entire swaths of the country and adapt them to a new normal, the new volatility that's already here, season after season, year after year. Sometimes um, we miss each other uh, in our movement, I think. Um, there are times when I speak to uh, people concerned with carbon uh, emissions. And um, I talk about the need for adaptation. And uh, what I hear is that, um, you know, it feels like I'm conceding away the possibility of, um, you know, reducing carbon emissions um, and thinking of climate change as a fate accompli. On the other hand, sometimes I speak to people focused largely on adaptation. Um, and you know, I say, well, look, why don't you expand your scope to mitigation projects, you know? Um, and, um, you know, they often say, yeah, but we, we, we don't have that bandwidth. You know, we, we're facing crisis year after year. And it's interesting, though, because there's a lot of fanfare made by, of, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its special report on 1.5 degrees. And it's, you know, it's basically assumed that 40% of the mitigation burden, if you like, must come from conserving energy, energy efficiency, retrofitting homes and built. And build. So there's kind of, that's the mitigate, that's a mitigation tool, probably larger than just about any other. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, the International Energy Agency says, well, it's unfortunate that there's no viable business model. And this speaks to the problem that, unless somebody can make money out of, out of climate protection, whether it be mitigation or adaptation, there seems to be no room in, in the discussion. So you've got bodies like the International Energy Agency are, you know, they actually say our numbers are giving us calls for despair, but they don't question this problem that if you think, you know, climate protection, whether it be adaptation or mitigation, if it's done, um, if it's only tied to people making private profit through private investments, then it kind of becomes, it doesn't become a public good anymore. This is a civilizational emergency where emissions generated anywhere in the world is, is harmful and emissions avoided would be a benefit to everyone. This is a sort of a global public goods model that we're trying to promote through trade unions for energy democracy. Because if it's all about mobilizing the private sector, we could be waiting a very long time, don't you think, in terms of getting a, a resilience core up and running in the US to protect us from what is really a, a rapidly unfolding humanitarian crisis in the form of climate instability. So you're, you know, do you think we've got the opportunity to change the narrative in some way? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Is that uh, we, um, we're so wired um, to think that solutions that can't come from and, and be supported by the market um, aren't viable um, and that um, it's, it's, too much of uh, a stretch to think that most Americans would support um, public solutions. I think that tide is turning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my experience is that um, while slow moving climate change narrated in degrees hasn't become a reality 
that many Americans are forced to grapple with. Um, what people are grappling with by the millions is disaster. Mm. People are grappling with the extraordinary loss of life, of property, of relationships, of community, of home, um, as a result of floods and fires, hurricanes and tornadoes. I've been to um, places in Florida and Louisiana, uh, places in Texas, where um, before a hurricane, um, people largely from a ideological, perhaps dogmatic point of view, um, really smoke, uh, spoke in the conservative talking points of the day uh, about a role for government. Um, but after their communities are flooded, they want the government to help. Um, they want a public option for recovery. They want government to, you know, to, to, um, to cover what insurance won't cover. Um, you know, again and again, we found uh, that uh, support for an expansion of the disaster social safety net, you know, a, a government funded um, rebuilding for homes that were uninsured, you know, um, government assistance, not just individual assistance, but large scale government assistance to cities um, so that they can rebuild uh, in order to keep their tax base. You know, these are largely um, supported uh, by vast, sw vast swaths of America um, that, you know, you wouldn't think is voting for more government. And I wonder if that's the opening, you know. Um, if you look at Texas, for example, um, Governor Abbott, you know, not the greatest champion of more government and big government and government spending, certainly not a champion of expanding public housing. He asked the, the federal government and HUD specifically for billions of dollars in assistance to rebuild the homes of the uninsured after Hurricane Harvey. You have Southern states lining up to HUD um, with applications for billions of dollars um, for rebuilding. And, you know, I think one, uh, one thing we need to do is to start attaching um, conditions to disaster relief and that kind of spending um, that, it, that it needs to, you know, we, we need to start attaching conditions um, that get us to mitigation um, and adaptation, get us to addressing the root causes of climate change with that money. I mean, your organization's proposals to both Florida state and also at the, at the federal level are, are certainly about securing those protections and making sure that a resilience core um, is, is, you know, good jobs and not sort of just random informal work where people end up going from one cycle of poverty to the next. Is, uh, if, is this something that can be, uh, you, you've got, for example, the proposal for a just energy transition in Florida, which is also talking about sort of often quite um, big projects in terms, or at least imp implies that there's some, uh, a lot of work to be done to reach that 45% um, target by 2030, I think it was in the case of Florida. Which brings me to a question about this issue of ambition. It seems that not just in the US, but globally, there's a, feeling that if we can get cities or regional governments, national governments, even continents, like in the case of the EU, to commit to ambitious plans, then we're sort of halfway home. When it seems the reality is there's no shortage of ambitious plans been laid out for climate protection since the 1990s. The problem is actually reaching the target. I always say it's quite easy to make a New Year's resolution that you want to be 40 pounds lighter by uh, July 4th weekend, but actually getting to that goal is a, is a more difficult task. Do you think we're a bit fixated on ambition and it should be a little bit more about the implementation now? And I'm thinking specifically about the Green New Deal narrative uh, that's come out, you know, came out of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and also Bernie Sanders. Um, there are lots of focus on on justice, lots of focus on ambition, but are we really, as a movement, really grappling with some of the real challenges of the, the technical challenges that are gonna come from reaching those targets? Well, I, 
I think that um, the Green New Deal has given us um, any imagination um, and um, has has given us a, a, a kind of wide campus a canvas, you know, to, to, to paint our dreams mm. on. I, I think that was really needed. Um, you know, uh, too often and for too many years, um, our conversation about climate was the province of scientists, uh, ecologists, um, increasingly community and labor organizers, um, but stayed in the realm of policy, stayed in the net realm of mm. budgets and, and, and money. And um, I think we needed, um, uh, we needed the, um, we, we needed a goal we could be proud of. We, we needed um, the anti-apartheid movement of our era. We needed the, the, um, the independence movement of our era. Um, you know, and, and if you think of what we're up against, we, we, we are up against um, fossil fuel companies um, who, um, you know, have been uh, incredibly imaginative in how to shape a narrative that serves them. Um, and, and we needed something um, that helped us dream that it was possible to take away their social license to operate. You know, all of that is in the Green New Deal. And I think now it's up to us in that framework to, to really kind of figure out um, what the delivery system is, what's the down payment of the, on the Green New Deal um, on day one of what we will hope to, 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 you know, is a new administration. What about the first hundred days? You know, we, we, we need to kind of scale up fast and fill the Green New Deal, um, which, I, which I think is what the, you know, the, the policy nexus around the Green New Deal is, is doing. Let's focus on, you know, the prospects of a, a new administration, if, if for a minute. I mean, you've got Joe Biden proudly saying he wouldn't ban fracking and also that the quite uh, openly distancing himself from the Green New Deal in his so-called debate with the president. Um, what can we expect and what in terms of getting the, um, this administration to, you know, to, t to do what needs to be done around around climate. Going back into the Paris Agreement, I've got an article coming out in New Labour Forum on this very subject, is considered by many in the sort of liberal community to, to be like, oh, well, that's going to be climate, our bit up for climate change once we go back into the Paris Agreement. I think people forget that, you know, 10 years ago, President Obama made commitments to the Paris Agreement that got rated D minus by some of the large environmental NGOs. In other words, that's hardly a solution is it but can we expect i mean what should the climate movement and uh, the resilience movement if you like be trying to get out of this administration how do we is it at state level we put pressure at states or are we trying to through um um you know our, our friends in congress if we have any you know what what, what should they be doing in, in, in the event of the biden coming to the white house well uh, i mean you know a few things. One is that um, all of us right now who are hard at work, um, mobilizing, taking people to the polls, um, you know, making sure that our democracy is saved, um, need to do it in such a way that we're not too exhausted, you know, after the election to remember what democracy is for. Um, you know, the whole point of working as hard as we're working, the whole point of this movement that is trying to save democracy and, um, and you know, usher in a new administration then needs to pivot and pressure that administration. Um, we need to make sure that that administration is a vehicle um, for the kinds of um, extraordinary um, changes we need. Um, and, you know, I think that includes um, 
you know, um, a, a broad set of uh, needs on climate change. It, it includes, um, you, you know, uh, everything all the environmental groups want from the administration on emissions, on, on environmental protections. Um, we need to rescind um, the bad executive orders of the Trump era and restore um, the Obama era protections, but that's just the bare minimum. That's just the work of day one. Um, the first hundred days, we need to, you know, move um, progress on on climate, and um, and then inside all of that, the truth is that we are far enough into the climate crisis that we need um, a large scale American project, ideally a public project around resilience. We need to look at all of our designs for living, our designs for commerce, our designs for community in the United States, and we need to rebuild them um, to make us um, more capable of surviving and thriving um, as we face the next storm and flood uh, and hurricane, because the Gulf Coast, the Midwest, um, the, the West Coast, um, you know, these parts of the country um, are going to continue to face climate vulnerabilities. And, and I think that's where, um, you know, uh, we need to make sure that is a public project, um, you know, not a, a, a vast network of contractors, um, you know, who are disaster profiteers uh, coming in and uh, making a, a cottage industry out of um, the growing need for resilience, but a large scale public workforce so that getting out of the climate crisis and getting out of the economic crisis are the same journey for poor people, uh, people of color, uh, rural people, you know, the people who, uh, who most desperately need these jobs. And, and let me tell you, Sean, you know, I, 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 uh, for a long time, we've represented um, welders and pipe fitters, you know, and, um, and we know someone, I know, I know many people uh, who've, you know, built um, Chevron plants and, and, and Exxon plants, um, you, you know, plants that, um, that, um, you know, contribute the worst pollution um, and particularly uh, to the places where people of color and poor people live, um, you know, in the Gulf Coast. Um, and those workers have then turned right around um, to build green energy plants in North Dakota um, and windmills in Illinois, you know. So, so we can pivot to rebuild, to build a new economy out of new sources of energy. Um, we just need to have it be a large scale national American project. And what you're saying is even those, those existing skills are transferable to a sort of resilience or mitigation agenda. I mean, this would be good, a good time given, I mean, what's happening in the oil and gas sector in the US is very, very interesting. I mean, we've got, you know, it's interesting that um, the Democratic candidate is saying he won't ban fracking. He may not need to because there's so much oversupply of shale gas in the, in, uh, in the world today that the fracking companies can barely cover their costs, let alone their, um, their debts. So they're in trouble. The, you know, back in April, 60% of the wells had basically been closed. Um, and we're talking about 100,000 workers in the oil and gas sector, which was booming seven or eight years ago, have now lost jobs. And many of them may not get those jobs back um, for years to come, given the sort of oversupply of oil and gas in the world that predates COVID uh, because of the oil wars between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia and the US. So here we are in this special moment, no pun intended, but a perfect storm politically, an opportunity to, um, you know, to really make some headway. You know, I do, do a lot of work with, with my colleagues, John Treat and Irene Shen at SLU on the international stage, and we're seeing the Green New Deal ideas uh, resonating everywhere but do you sort of find that, uh, and is there anything overseas that you find inspiring or interesting in terms of how 
different regions or countries may be dealing with um, similar similar challenges, or is this something the U.S. is going to be leading uh, leading from the front in terms of um, building this resilience core and putting a whole new pro public agenda out there? Well, you know, um, most of um, the inspiration I get is from um, small towns and cities across America. Um, and I, I, I think that um, probably what we'll be doing um, is taking things that exist on the ground and scaling them up, uh, applying our imagination to think of how something that's being carried out right now by 20 or 200 workers um, can tomorrow um, you know, uh, come to life um, through the hands and the labor, the talent of 200,000. So an example of that is in New Orleans, um, we just launched the first ever resilience core. Um, ultimately, we believe that's what's needed across America, um, a large scale publicly funded core, uh, not of volunteers, but of well-paid people with benefits uh, on career ladders, um, going into long-term uh, work in industries very different uh, from the ones that are crumbling in the era of climate change and the pandemic. In New Orleans, um, we've taken people who, are, um, who were laid off and adrift as a result of COVID. New Orleans is a city that runs on tourism, as you know, runs mm -hmm. on the service sector. Um, bartenders, restaurant workers, service industry workers, valet parkers, the entire infrastructure that serves um, the New Orleans cultural economy is full of people earning minimum wage, um, $7.25 an hour. Um, we are taking those people and bringing them into a resilience core, um, a, 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 a pilot jobs core um, that retrains those workers um, in being responsive to the pandemic um, and the climate recovery. Um, they're being taken, you know, these are, you know, I was just with a group of people who are bartenders and yoga instructors. They're being turned into community health workers and will be able at the end to get jobs in healthcare. Uh, but they might also just stay as community health workers. They were earning seven twenty-five. Mm -hmm. They're now at $12 an hour with a path to 18. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we hope that this will become institutionalized and, uh, um, you know, part of the firmament, the firmament of New Orleans, part of the way um, that New Orleans prepares for the coming floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and, and health risks. Um, these community health workers, I was just with them for, for a few days. We were... Um, you know, going to the places where the um, climate refugees from Lake Charles displaced by two hurricanes in a row are staying and we were administering to their needs. So that's just a little example of how, um, you know, when um, the federal government um, fails as it has so spectacularly um, after Katrina and now again during the pandemic, when the federal government becomes um, hijacked, you know, by a class of people um, who are out to profit rather than serve, um, there is still hope everywhere. And, and it exists in the cities, in the municipalities, in the localities, not just um, in New Orleans, but, you know, in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy, an entire network of health workers, volunteers, recovery workers, many of them, a vast proportion of them, uh, immigrants, rural people came to cooperate and help. There's no reason why those um, people who are laboring couldn't be treated as workers, paid as such, recognized as the public servants that they are. There's no reason why, uh, you know, I, I, we have, um, we have uh, 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 you know, a lot of experience in Florida where in the panhandle, um, immigrant workers, uh, who came to rebuild connected to the homeowners whose homes they were rebuilding. 
those homeowners joined us as volunteers and assisted in the rebuilding. You know, when people with talent and people with heart and resources work, what we need to do is um, recognize that work, you know, and understand that it's a public service and then pay them as if these were public sector workers. And that's really what we're pushing for. At the end of the day, you know, um, we're never going to create something wholesale through the federal government that doesn't exist already locally. So our work right now is to take inspiration from everything that's happening locally and prepare in January to really make the argument for scaling it up. What you sort of, uh, you, the, your words evoke this kind of vision of the world that sort of Naomi Klein talks about in some of her writings, sort of a rejuvenative, um, caring world, which it seems like, you know, if, we're, if there's obviously when a hurricane or a, a wildfire hits a community or a dam bursts, a flood, we're talking about a disaster, but, you know, so many people's lives are, are, are disasters, in, in a, you know, and their families are disasters that it's almost like this could, this model of, of, um, of, people helping each other, or showing human solidarity, of empathy. It just could really take off in the context of a climate emergency and a pandemic, because we've seen such a, as you point out in some of the things you've written recently in, in COVID, the, the proliferation of mutual aid groups who are basically giving up their free time everywhere to help their neighbors in need. And it's just been very inspiring. We saw it certainly after Sandy here in this city, in New York City, with the Occupy Sandy movement. Um, so there's a, there's a vision there. Do, do, should we be operating also not just on a policy level, but that human interrelationship level that many of my generation tend to like disregard as being kind of soft and wet behind the ears is actually going to be more important in this, as part of this narrative going forward. You know, um, I think you're, you're getting to um, some of the questions in the box, Sean, that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. And there's a question by Brian who points out that um, the, the Green New Deal polls actually very well. Um, you know, uh, I guess I, I would say the point I'm making is not that jobs programs and public programs don't poll well. Uh, the point I'm making is, is more along the the lines that that what uh, more along the lines of what you're saying, Sean, which is that um, because of the crisis in everyone's lives, whether after a hurricane or during the pandemic, or just because the economy has been a disaster, you know, mm. uh, just because um, you know life has not been easy and the market is stacked up against ordinary people, um, because of that there is a cultural opening we haven't seen. And our question is, how do we walk into that? How do we take the opening? You know, um, the cynical way to do it um, is, um, is something we've seen a, a lot. Every time disaster happens, um, it's followed by um, what Naomi Klein uh, perfectly <laughs> diagnosed as shock doctrine, you know? Mm -hmm. but, but there is... A, a, a different way to do it. There is a hopeful way to do it. Every, for every person uh, who sits in a room and figures out how to um, privatize a school, there's a neighborhood that wants public education because that's what will help heal after a disaster. So um, I actually think there's um, an opening for cooperation, an opening for... Um, for public um, engagement, for public sector work um, after disasters. I think the tricky part and the part we're not seeing um, is that, you know, um, we know that disasters compound inequality. Um, we've all read Naomi Klein, that, that, that analysis now we've all accepted. We know that after Katrina, after, after Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey and New York, um, we know that um, is playing out in, in Puerto Rico, Texas, and Florida. What we don't see so much of, uh, what is often invisible, is how recoveries have become hidden drivers of inequality. 
our way of doing disaster recovery in this country right now is an enormous accelerator, perhaps the greatest one of inequality. Um, the way we do recovery right now helps widen the racial wealth gap and in fact transfers wealth from renters, from the poor, uh, particularly from black, Latino and indigenous people and transfers it, um, as you could imagine, to white homeowners uh, because owning a home is proxy um, for race in this country. And so, you know, my fear is that we may all unite and band together and agree that we need a recovery. The question is what kind of recovery and can we make sure um, that that recovery uh, will help those most in need of it? Um, or will that recovery just push resources up through the marketplace to those who are already positioned to profit from it? And exactly. that's, that's what we need, uh, you know, uh, our debate to, um, um, to accomplish, you know. On the question of debate, like, why don't we turn now after those uplifting words, Sackett, to some of the questions we've got. I see Miriam Thompson. I hope that's the Miriam Thompson I know and love for many years. I haven't seen her for a long time, though. What can a mobilized labor force do to demand a local, state, and federal government response, especially when the same forces the speaker identified, like Texas governor, that's you, the speaker, um, are suppressing the vote, another political climate disaster. Um, unpick that one. Can you do that, Sackett, and you see that question? Yeah, Miriam? yes, yes. Well, um, I guess she, she's referring to the sort of, we got, we got a small problem of, of right-wing um, Republican governors to deal with. Yes, yes. Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, um, in Florida, um, there's a, a, a really robust movement building that's been building for a, a, a long time um, because Florida has been ground zero for climate change and climate disaster. Um, that movement is vibrant, it's diverse, um, it's connecting dots um, in exactly the way that need to be connected. So, um, you know, there is a statewide um, organization, New Florida Majority, that is um, engaging millions of voters, you know, around climate resilience, but also about around race and racial justice and, and gender and health care. Um, there are community organizations in Miami um, that have been fighting climate gentrification. Uh, in the Florida panhandle, the resilience workforce that um, that has come in that is largely an immigrant workforce rebuilding um, you know the Florida panhandle uh, has been also fighting for uh, you know fairer rules of recovery um, and so you know that's really what we need is um, is a multifaceted movement for just recovery um, and for the kind of resilience that is publicly funded, the kind of resilience um, where the workers at the heart of it um, get the dividends of, of the work that they're doing um, and where we're not struggling just to uh, repair our house back to the way it was, uh, get a house uh, that was outdated back up to code, but that we're building a new uh, where we're powering an American renewal um, to be more resilient uh, to the challenges of the future. I think that's that's the resilience movement that we're um, that we're driving and pushing for. That's great. I'm I'm seeing a question here. I think it's uh, Brian McTiernan. I hope I didn't do uh, injustice to your name, Brian. You know, raising a good point about about public opinion and. I, I think it's one of the things that in the left people feel, well, we have to have public opinion, win everybody over and then until we sort of end up doing something. Um, is, there, is there something to be said by the kind of leading from the front by example um, of showing what can be accomplished without trying to engage in 
sort of long debates about how to win people over from fairly fixed views. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, one, one flood, one hurricane can change consciousness pretty quickly anyway, in terms of the need for uh, resiliency and, and well, well uh, resourced public services. What, what's your thinking about the public opinion dimension of this, um, of the, these ideas? I think we're living through a really profound moment where um, certainly more Americans than ever um, are aware that their home isn't fixed and their place on whatever economic rung of the ladder they were on is not guaranteed. And I think when you're in that place, two things can happen. Either your views can change very fast or your views can become hardened very fast. Mm -hmm. Um, The difference is organizing, you know, Um, the difference is who's around you to help you uh, feel cared for and come to the conclusion that you're not on your own. And I think that is, um, uh, the kind of transformation people are going through anyway. Our question is, will we be there to make the difference between them concluding we're on the, on our own and we have to harden um, to, well, actually there is support, there is help. Uh, we're a community and, and we're worth something. We can ask for more. Um, you know, that's not to say that, we're all equal here. Uh, Racism, um, you you know, national uh, origin, immigration status, all of these play out, gender, um, sexuality, all of these play out. Um, And at the same time, um, we are just at this this inflection point um, where um, people's profoundest Um, instincts, their profoundest motivations um, are really up for grabs. I've seen this myself um, uh, even just weeks ago in Louisiana or months ago in Florida, uh, where people who had been lifelong conservative voters uh, were speaking not in political terms, but in personal terms uh, about what they needed, um, not out of shame, but, but with a kind of sense that, of course, we deserve it because we're not responsible for the conditions that created that need. Now, that's not perfect, but that is an opening. I just think as organizers, our job is not to sit back and critique people for where they are or wait for public opinion to catch up. You know, if, if we had a majority, we, don't, we, we wouldn't need a social movement. The point of a social movement um, is to take... Um, you know, to take culture and line it up with the needs of the people with the least, um, not around the needs of the people with the most. Um, and, and, you know, there, there wasn't widespread public, um, you know, support for the March on Washington before it happened. Of course. Yeah. Now, there's not going to be widespread public support um, for these uh, demands. But the, the fact that there is um, a great deal of agreement um, among the people I speak to, um, that something needs to change. That's our opening. One of, the, one of the most active unions in trade unions for energy democracy is the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, who um, have been fighting threats to privatize the system now for a number of years. But one of the things they've done is sort of to, to reinvent the post office, not just as something that delivers mail, but something as a, a basically as a hub for community activities, where even postal workers would report, um, you know, to, you know, health officials, if there was, they felt somebody was in, you know, had not opened their mailbox for several days. And there was a sort of a service that they were involved in. And um, and now they're also trying to uh, propose that postal post offices become, you know, hubs for renewable energy for, you know, solar generation and so on. So it's, it's, captured the imagination of a lot of other unions as well. Do we see that, again, going back to the, and we're getting questions here about the the labor movement, that's what we might call the 
the conventional labor movement, the sort of the AFSCMEs, the AFTs, the SEIUs, the, those unions, of course, which are very diverse in, in many respects. Can we, um, is, are the, are, do we have champions inside labor who could, who could advocate for this kind of vision that you're laying out? Um, oh, or is, is it there already? Absolutely. I think, I think there are um, champions inside labor. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to remember the labor movement fundamentally is its workers. And we do need to line up um, the climate movement with um, a way forward for these workers. The example you gave of the uh, of of um, the postal workers union in Canada is a really good one. You, you know, expanding the scope of work of those postal workers helps society. It also helps those postal workers. Course, um, yeah. And you know, and the fact is, um, you know, you have to be out um, in rural Florida or rural Louisiana. Um, to fully appreciate uh, how important that postal worker is in that proverbial last mile um, mm -hmm. that year he walks. Um, and it's not just postal workers. Um, a, you know, a fire station in a place like the Florida Panhandle or in the unincorporated town of Louisiana, um, you, you know, is, is a deeply relevant hub of support, of resilience, um, a lifeline in a way that the fire station um, in New York uh, or, or Chicago, um, you know, may not be. Um, people from miles around look to that fire station or that post office, um, that, that uh, you know, firefighter or that postal worker um, as, as a lifeline, as, a, as relief, as support. Um, these are our first responders. Um, you know, they're often our, um, our line of, um, of uh, our lifeline, you know, our connection to emergency support. But I think it goes beyond that. I, I think that, um, you know, to the extent that we can um, really um, posit a national project around resilience as um, a public sector project. I think that's our way to uh, to really build common cause with public sector unions and renew them uh, in this country. As we do that, we should be planning to fill up the ranks of public sector unions. We're seeing in in other countries, um, you know, sort of municipal authorities reclaiming services that were privatized in the past, particularly power grids and. Um, even everything from parking um, parking meters, <laughs> which were privatized in some cities. So there's this new, um, in one of the publications I read that you put out, there was this kind of, this sense that they, there is a pendulum swinging back towards the public and surely the COVID experience around health and the privatization of senior set, uh, citizen centers all over the world. I think the Spanish government has taken them back into public ownership. You know, is this, uh, this sounds like it's a, a good time. Uh, if we're going to have a pandemic and a climate emergency, it might, there might be something, uh, as you say, a sort of a moment where we can, we can sort of take advantage of this in a way that we can rebuild our societies as best we can, as opposed to sort of having a shock doctrine approach where there's always money to be made from someone else's misery. And that, that's obviously not a good, good thing. I don't know how we're doing for time. I'm, I'm waiting for some guidance from the organizers here, but I think we're probably getting um, closer, close to the end of, of this interview. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Um, let's uh, do some sort of takeaways from the discussion, Sackett. What do you, um, tell us you know, where you see, where your, you know, your priorities are in the, in the coming weeks and how, um, and you know, what, what, obviously the election is on everybody's mind at the moment. And, um, and from a Florida perspective, are they, is, is weather and, and um, you know, general instability of the climate affecting the consciousness there in terms of the, uh, you know, the November election? Well, you know, it, it, it certainly is. Um, you know, the election is on people's minds. Um, 
and hundreds of organizers um, are on the doors. Uh, you know, we saw the images of um, people waiting at the polls 11 hours, seven hours, you know, in Georgia. Um, you know, we're not through the hurricane season. Um, hurricane Sandy uh, happened later on in the season. Um, and we've already had the most active hurricane season in, you know, in 15 years. Um, so for tens of thousands of people, um, you know, the pandemic is past, um, the election is far away, and what they're struggling with, what they're facing right now is just a question of how to come home. Um, and I think that's the difficulty of this moment is um, there are swaths of people for whom immediate need and immediate crisis is so great that even planning two weeks ahead, a month ahead seems like a luxury. Um, that doesn't stop us in our work, but it does mean that our work needs to be relevant in real time um, to ordinary people. Um, you know, we're pushing ahead to propose a large scale a climate resilience workforce in America um, that we want uh, to be well paid, um, to come with benefits, um, and to include the formerly incarcerated immigrants, people with debt, you know, uh, people who don't have as easy a journey into a good job because they're in a zip code or a labor market mm. that has barriers and constraints. So. Um, you know, that's, um, that's our uh, vision. It's, um, we think, uh, one that has enormous public support, uh, but needs to become a national priority. And, um, you know, we need help from everywhere, uh, you know, pushing for that, building a powerful um, call for that. In the meantime, we also need... Um, the recovery from the pandemic, um, the recovery from floods, and fires, and the preparation for next year's um, pandemic, next year's floods and fires, um, to be designed in a way um, that is equitable. Uh, we used to talk about the digital divide in this, in this country, it still exists. The, the newer divide is this resilience divide. Um, there are people who are more likely uh, to bounce back. And then there are people who are experiencing the latest hurricane or the COVID outbreak, um, you know, as only the most recent chapter, uh, you know, in a hundreds of years long history of disinvestment, um, racism, um, and, um, you know, and, and poverty. And, and so how we, uh, how we build resilience that is collective, publicly funded, um, and looks forward uh, to rewrite the rules. That's, I think, what we need to all be fighting for. That's great. I mean, that's phenomenal work you're doing. I mean, it reminds me of the, um, not many years ago, the British Labour Party and the union supported the uh, Million Climate Jobs campaign. It was a major um, breakthrough at the time. Um, unfortunately, the Labour Party lost the election for, due to reasons that I think was somewhat beyond their own control with Brexit and so on, but I'm sure this, these ideas will resurface. Um, and um, we've got, I've got a, a couple of announcements I need to make before we, we close, and um, there's a, some upcoming um, slew events, uh, School for Labour and Urban Studies, um, there's confronting COVID workers and unions on the front line. That's going to be on the 15th, which I believe is next Wednesday, with Sarah Nelson, of course, from the American Flight Attendant CWA, um, who was part of the Global Trade Union Assembly we convened over the summer with over a thousand participants from 120 different countries, which went very, very successfully. And Ruth Milkman, uh, CUNY SLU, will be um, there too. And then there's Economic, Racial and Immigrant Justice, a Progressive Congressional Agenda for 2021. And that's going to be on third, the, Thursday, the 22nd. I hope I'm not missing anything there with Pramila Jayapal and um, of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and our own Deepak Bhargava at CUNY SLU. I um, hope I didn't miss any of those events or um, forget to say something. Um, 
I'm going to just thank you, Sakit, for taking time out of being on the front line down there um, in Florida and and Louisiana. I know you've been there recently. Uh, uh, We obviously are right behind everything you're doing. These ideas are, uh, the time has come. In fact, it came a long time ago, but I think people are waking up now to this, to the sort of big ideas, bold plans, uh, and audacious suggestions that are, that you're uh, championing and we're right with you on that and uh, thank you for uh, for doing this work long before any of us were Sean oh, that's very that's very uh, generous of you we're, we're all all in this together trying to work something out um, for our common future um, it would be nice to think that a few decades from now we'll have a stable climate and a stable society with far more equality all around and uh, that's our dream it keeps us working keeps us going so Sackett Sony thanks for being part of this really interesting interview and I'll see you somewhere down the tracks and thanks to my colleagues at CUNY SLU who put on this event so I'll leave it to them to do the technology and I'll say goodbye to you Sackett thank you